I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So hello and welcome to the Extreme History Project Lecture Series. My name is Crystal Alegria and I am the Director of Extreme History. Our mission at the Extreme History Project is to make history relevant. And we do that through this lecture series, historic walking tours and bus tours, and most re recently a podcast called The Dirt on the Past. So you'll have to be sure to check out that podcast. It's available anywhere you get your podcasts and also available on the Extreme History Project website. I do have a few housekeeping tips before we begin. We are in webinar format tonight, so you can hear us, but we can't hear you. So if you have questions, please write those in the Q&A box that you can access at the bottom of your screen. If you have thoughts and comments, you can use the chat button also located at the bottom of your screen. At the end of Laura's presentation tonight, you can have, ask questions, so be thinking of questions during her presentation, and I will help facilitate that, Laura. I'll read the questions for you when, we're, when we get to that point. But I wanted to give a big thank you to our sponsor this evening, Pat Jacobs and ARC Trio. Pat Jake Jacobs is a resident of Virginia City and has a great love for that special place. So she was excited to help make this presentation happen tonight. We thank her for continued support of our lecture series, and we thank her for her continued support of extreme history in general. Thanks, Pat. I know you're out there. We are so excited to kick off the 10th year of our lecture series. I can't believe we've been doing it that long. As the saying goes, time flies when you're having fun. The lecture series was one of the first programs we started when we um, first formed Extreme History, and we have kept it free of charge all these years because we feel it has so much value, and we want as many people as possible to take advantage of this lecture series. If you enjoy the series and all of our other programming at Extreme History, and if you have the means, we would sure appreciate your help financially to keep it going. You can do this via Venmo if you're Venmo savvy, I'm kind of getting Venmo savvy. <laughs> Not quite there yet, though. You could do it through a small donation of $5, 10 $20 by popping a check in the mail to us. Or you could do it by becoming a member of the Extreme History Project. So Cheryl is going to put the links to all these options in the chat box. So thanks, Cheryl, for doing that. Appreciate it. We're a grassroots organization funded by our community, which is all of you out there in Zoom land tonight. So thanks in advance for your support. We really do truly appreciate it. I'm so excited to have Laura Arada with us this evening. I've heard about her research on Sarah Bigford for many years now and have been watching and waiting for this book to come out on this very prominent and infamous Virginia City resident. So Laura's book was published last year. Is that right, Laura, in 2020? Oh my gosh, was 2020 that long ago already? Yeah, July, I think, 2020. 2020, I know. And so it was published last year and I was so excited to see it and bought it right up and read it right away. So Laura J. Arata is an assistant professor of history and director of public history at Oklahoma State University in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Her research specializations include race and gender in the American West, popular and material culture, historic preservation, and oral history. Her publications have appeared in Montana, the Magazine of Western History, in the Pacific Northwest Quarterly, and in edited collections on the Hanford History Project in Washington State. She discovered Sarah Bigford's story while attending a public history field school in Virginia City. How cool is that? A public history field school. Um, Race and the Wild West is her first monograph. So welcome, Laura, and thank you for writing this book and for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited that this event is happening and that there's so many people from Virginia City here. Um, I am so honored to just have a few minutes to talk with you about this really incredible woman and this place and a story that are so close to my heart. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to outline a little bit of my research journey and the journey of writing this first book about Sarah. 
And then I'm also excited to share a little bit more on just some of the details of her life and hopefully that'll spark some good conversation at the end. Um, so I hope that this helps us all to just think a little bit more about the story of Sarah herself and the world she lived in and the legends that she really does help to ensure persist and that we all still know and love today. Um, and we'll also talk really, really briefly about the history of Montana and the vigilantes and Western tourism. I'm assuming a lot of this audience already knows quite a bit about a lot of those things, um, but they're all still really relevant to us. So important that we take note of them. Um, but I have to start since this is the extreme history project and this mission is so close to my heart of making history accessible. Um, I have to start by telling you that I didn't begin graduate school intending to write this story and I didn't intend to get a PhD. I had no ambitions of that. Um, and I wanted to note that I grew up in the West on a working ranch, um, which was in California, but like, don't hold that against me. Um, and, but I grew up very much steeped in the ideas of what the Wild West was supposed to have been. Um, and in these images here, which just wanted to share very quickly, um, this is my grandfather and my father and a draft horse that I believe was named Queenie. Um, and we were still very much planting fields with a team of horses like this when I was growing up. So the Wild West to me was something I lived. Um, it wasn't something I planned to study. And I didn't think of it as legends. I thought of it as a world that I actively inhabited. Um, and then there's a story that we don't have time for about how I accidentally started a master's degree and like the rest of that is history, but that's a different story. Um, but it is worth noting that the first time an advisor told me that I should consider getting a PhD and maybe like writing about history, my response was like, <laughs> like those are for smart people. That's so like not anything I've ever envisioned myself doing. Um, but so my hesitation in, in taking that leap um, really shapes the way that I approach history now and believing that it should be accessible and given space to just be interesting. Um, sometimes as historians, we get really wrapped up in our analysis and of these big historical contingencies and all of those things are important. Um, but it's also really important to just tell good stories. And I have been really humbled by just getting to tell Sarah's story. And I've learned so much in the process. And so I'm really glad to be able to share a little bit of that with everyone. Um, so this quote, which came out of my mouth, and um, I believe Marge is with us. I'm sure Marge has heard these words come out of my mouth um, over the course of many years in Virginia City. Um, Sarah and I have been on this journey together for about a decade now. And in that time, her story really profoundly changed my life. And it started with this realization um, when someone asked me to articulate why I felt compelled to write about her and why I needed to write a whole book about her. Um, and I remember this coming out of my mouth. Well, you know, she's a black female public utilities owner promoting tourism at the site of a lynching. And th there has to be a bigger story there. Like needless to say, you don't just tumble into that kind of tourism and promotion and business ownership, right? Like something happens where you make an active decision. Um, but that was very much the narrative just because that was the information that was available at the time. And I didn't really know yet sort of what being a historian was all about, but I couldn't let that go because Sarah deserved better. Um, so here's another one for Marge. My journey really intentionally started here in Virginia City at a, a public history field school. Um, if you're from Virginia City or you've been there, this is inside the Kramer building, um, which really was the spark for me of getting interested in history I could hold and touch with my hands and work with. Um, 
And so this is at a public history field school five months after I became a master's student and very much had no idea um, what public history was. I had never been to Montana before this moment, um, but I do recall right before going there, a couple of family members being like, oh, that place is really old. It's like ghost town. It's like super wild westy. It's exactly like what you would want to see. And I was very excited about that, um, having grown up you know, loving legends of the wild west. Um, but I had absolutely no intention of studying any of this. And, you know, this is one thing I really wanted to mention in relation to the extreme history project. Um, it's just the way that history absolutely matters and needs to be widely available outside of academia. And this is really important work because we don't always know what we're interested in in history until we are. Um, and that's so special. Um, and so it's also really important and just, you know, really crucial that we talk about the kinds of history we don't often grow up talking about or studying, as was the case in my family, which was in an area where we were pretty isolated and we didn't talk a lot about race um, and different people's perspectives. And I knew nothing about Black history when I started college at the University of Washington um, but I had the coincidental good luck that my very first class there, my very first semester um, was with Dr. Quinard Taylor, who I didn't know at the time, but he was like the most prominent historian of African-Americans in the West, in the country. Um, and I'd like to think that that opened me up to being ready to hear Sarah's story. And just as a side note, Quinard Taylor is the series editor of the series in which Race and the Wild West appears. So that's a pretty cool coming full circle. Um, so enough about me. On to Sarah. All the rest of this will be about Sarah, I promise. Um, there are two comments that really shaped this research journey for me, and I just wanted to share them up front. This was the first one. You will never find the sources to write that book. Um, and as a note, this was something that was said to me by multiple people and often with really, really good intentions, even people who really enthusiastically supported the idea of writing about Sarah in some way, but just were really concerned, like, how was I going to find enough information? Um, how was I going to find enough source material? And when I started this journey, pretty much everything that was known about Sarah's life fit on one eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that was posted on a building wall in Virginia City. And we'll talk about that building um, shortly. There were some ideas floating around about Sarah and there were a few little things here and there, but that was pretty much it. And so I had snippets like this one, um, this little advertisement that appeared in the Madisonian in 1880, um, noting a restaurant that she ran at one time. Um, but so that left open a really big question. How was I ever possibly going to make a whole dissertation and then a whole book out of this information? And it, you know, just like, it wasn't quite clear yet. I wasn't sure that I had the research skills for that to be possible. Um, but then there was a second comment that really shaped this journey. And that was, I can tell you really care about her. And this seems really simple, but it's really important. Um, in traditional historical training, a lot of times we're you know, pretty often taught that we need to be really objective, which we do. It is important to be objective. Um, but sometimes that's taken as meaning really neutral or dispassionate about our subjects. And those are not the same thing. Being objective is not the same thing as being dispassionate. And you know, sometimes history that's told in a way that it's so objective is to be without emotion. Um, it can be necessary, but it's also one of the reasons that a lot of people think history is boring, right? And why history gets lost or ignored. Um, so it's always really important that we let our sources and our historical subjects speak for themselves. We have to be really careful not to drown them out in narratives of what we wish might have happened, which of course we have no control over. Um, but this was a moment 
that opened my eyes that it was really okay for me to just care about this story. And it was okay to say it matters to me. And there was one really crucial moment that shaped this journey. And it was this little snippet. So we're not worried about the first lines, we're worried about the second lines um, in this snippet. Um, so I was not looking for this when I found it. And that's how a lot of good like historical discoveries happen, I find. Um, I was actually looking for information on the flight of the Nez Perce and perceptions of Virginia City residents to the Nez Perce War of 1877. So that, like it wasn't really even on my radar. I had kind of filed Sarah Bickford away as someone I might not be able to write a whole dissertation on. So I was, you know, if I saw something, I would take notes, but I hadn't really actively made the decision that I was going to write about her life at this moment. Um, and then this popped up in some other research I was doing. I was really like on a microfilm machine, like one of the old school ones where you have to like reel the film through it and sit there and like read every page for the little snippet you're looking for. Um, and when I saw this, and it took me a minute to realize what I was looking at, um, but I kind of felt like I had been punched in the throat a little bit. Like I really had to sit and take a minute with this. Um, so up to this point, it was known that Sarah had three children in a first marriage in Virginia City and that all three of those children had died. And that information was on that single type sheet of paper in a Virginia City building. Um, but we only knew the names for sure of one of those children. There's a daughter named Ava who died in 1881. That was pretty well known. Um, but so this one sentence, told me so much about Sarah's life and her experiences. Um, so this was the first source that identified James Leonard Brown, one of Sarah's children from her first marriage. And I realized like in a very literal and very meaningful way that if I took on this research with just this one little source, I was gonna be able to give James Leonard Brown back his name. So in all of those spaces where it was just said, she had a son who died, I could say, no, James Leonard died. We can name him. Um, and I literally sat there at the microfilm machine and cried and like might cry a little bit now, I'm not gonna lie, um, but there was no going back from there. And the other part of this that has always stayed with me, um, so this appeared on December 29th, and you'll see it notes that James Leonard died on December 24th. Um, Sarah always insisted that her birthday was December 25th. So this was a powerful moment in getting to know the person that I wanted to write about and putting all the other logistics aside and just saying, I'm gonna do this because I care about her. And however it turns out is how it will turn out, but I'm going to try. So I need to not cry. So now we're going to take just a little second and detour through some quick Montana history. Um, I imagine a lot of this audience is familiar with this. So we're going to go really fast. But if there's any questions, please pop them into the chat and I'll be happy to chat about them at the end. Um, so just a very quick recap, because to understand Sarah's really extraordinary life, we have to understand the place where she spent most of her life and the circumstances of the world that she lived in. Um, so the quickest of timelines for how this all comes about. And of course, I'm leaving a lot out here because we only have so much time. But first, there's Dakota territory, which is massive. And once white Americans start moving there in large numbers, it's pretty quickly becomes apparent that it's way too unwieldy to govern in the state that it's in. So Congress divides it, creating Idaho territory out of lands that are situated between the Pacific Northwest, um, present day Washington and Oregon, and then the Dakotas. And then of course, gold is discovered in what is now Bannock in 1862. So there's another rush of settlers into that territory. Um, and then Idaho territory, also quickly proves far too big and unwieldy to govern. And a big part of that is just the sheer distance that's involved in getting from the territorial capital, which is in Lewiston, to anywhere else that's over the mountains. Um, and especially in the winter, that's 
almost impossible at the time. So in May of 1864, Congress divides that territory yet again, resulting in Montana. And of course, right in that juncture between those things, gold is discovered in Alder Gulch um, and Virginia City is founded. So in May of 1864, crucial moment of the story, Congress kind of has some other pressing concerns. You know, there's a little thing called the Civil War that's happening. There's some other things to worry about. Um, and so Congress did what it does best and created this new territory and then promptly adjourned and left it without any civil criminal codes. Um, and since the territory lacks things like jails and a judiciary and effective law enforcement and a lot of the things that would kind of typically define a new territorial place, um, it probably seems a little superfluous to Congress at that moment that these things are like imminently necessary. Um, so there's some semblance of government that has started, but it's not fully developed yet. And it's only a short moment that that's the case. Um, but it's gonna be a moment that has some really profound consequences for our story. So I love this quote. This appeared in the New York Herald in 1864, just a couple months before Montana territory is created. Um, and so it's the fate of all mining countries that the first pages of their history have to be written in blood. It's so dramatic, right? It's the perfect setup for the story that we're telling here. Um, so the gold strikes at Bannock and Virginia City happen in the midst of an already really chaotic time overall for the country. And Virginia City is very much born in that moment of transition in the midst of all this hope and promise of opening up new lands for settlement and the looming distress and all the destruction of the Civil War and the conquest of the Far West and the movements of all different kinds of people around the country. Um, and that makes this history so dynamic and so interesting. Um, so Sarah at this point is about 12 years old and she's living in Tennessee, quite literally just kind of waiting to hear about her freedom. Um, but if it's the fate of all mining countries to have their first pages of their history written in the blood, we probably shouldn't be surprised to find some vigilantes roaming these pages. Um, and so of course we need to take just a quick second to talk about the vigilantes because they will become such a big part of Sarah's story. Um, so when I started this research, I had no idea that the vigilantes were going to loom this large. Um, Sarah owned a building very closely connected with their legend, but it was kind of implied, if not outright said, that that was sort of coincidental, that she happened to own that building and, you know, just it happened to be this location. And I always kind of was like, well, maybe I feel like there has to be more to that story. Um, how am I going to figure that out, right? How am I going to investigate that? Um, but if you're from or have been to Montana, you're probably laughing like a little bit right now at my naivete because you can't go anywhere in Montana without hearing about the vigilantes, right? We all know this. They are everywhere and on everything. Um, just think of how often you see 3777 or the symbols, like notes of them on things. And that's for good reason. It's a really good story. The vigilantes are a really, really fascinating story. Um, and they're widely credited and still widely celebrated with, you know, resting civilization out of this very recalcitrant wilderness that probably looked about like it looks here in this image from 1866. Um, but it's really important to note, Virginia City at this time is a bustling place and it's a busy place and it's the territorial capital, um, but it's still very isolated and still very much doesn't feel like part of the states as Sarah's contemporaries would have referred to the rest of the country. Um, so isolation, yes. Limited ability to enforce the laws, also yes, things are happening in Montana that make it really challenging. Um, 
but technically, and just, you know, we have to make note of this to be like good historians. Um, the territorial legislature has met by the end of 1864 in Bannock. It's the only one that's in Bannock and then it moves to Virginia City. Um, but the first vigilante lynchings take place in January. So technically Montana does have a criminal code by the time the vigilante is really set in earnest about um, their mission of reading the territory of suspected criminals. But there's this long-standing belief that accompanies their legend that because they didn't have law, they're going to just have to create order without law. And, you know, to an extent, we can acknowledge that any means of enforcing a punishment that wasn't banishment or execution is pretty difficult. Your options are pretty limited in 1865 Montana. Um, but... There technically was a criminal code and a lot of the men who are present on this frontier um, have experience on other mining frontiers. They've been in places like California. So they're kind of anticipating that there might be problems as winter sets in and Montana's isolation is gonna be really profoundly felt because all those mountain passes are gonna be closed. Um, so they feel like they have to do something um, and if you're not super familiar with the story of the vigilantes, for whatever reason, that something is that they start lynching suspected criminals, broadly accusing them of being road agents. And all of this takes place before Sarah arrives. But those legacies are going to really profoundly shape her life because they shape Virginia City. And that is the world she lives in and that we still find so fascinating. So um, it's important to note that by the time Sarah arrives in 1871, Virginia City has already reached its peak declining and it's going to continuously decline over the course of the next six decades that she lives there. And that's also going to shape her experiences. Um, but when she arrives, Virginia City is very much still in its final moments of its experience being the territorial capital and being kind of a hub of business and different kinds of commercial activities in Montana territory. Um, but within a decade of her arrival, it's being described by this, which is one of my favorite quotes I've ever found about this time period. Um, from an 1885 history of Montana that says Virginia City has been spoken of as dead and crooning over the embers of departed glory, which is just a, such a great dramatic moment. I use it in everything. Um, but by 1885, when this book appears that this quote is in, Sarah's been in Virginia City for almost 15 years. She's coming up on 15 years. And in that time, she has married, given birth to three children, lost all three of those children, divorced that husband, remarried her second husband, and given birth to another child. And in the midst of she's running businesses and she's doing all kinds of other things. Um, so in 1885, Virginia City might be crooning over those embers of departed glory of not being the territorial capital anymore. But Sarah's just getting started on her journey that makes her visible in the historical records to us. Um, so I do just want to spend a second on this first decade of her life, and we're going to spend the rest of our time on later parts of her life. Um, but this is just a brief timeline. These were the years that were thought to be the most unrecoverable when I started my research about Sarah, that was very much a sense that anything there was to know is lost and was probably lost with her and people who you know, knew her immediately. Um, but the story of her life wasn't gonna be complete without these details. I really wanted to know more. So, you know, you really have to think about this. One decade and just think about how much this is to experience um, a marriage. That marriage was incredibly abusive. John Brown beats her frequently. Um, there's records of that that have emerged. 
losing all three of her children, going through a divorce, which is a hugely actually important thing for a woman at that time, especially a black woman who's married to a white man. And like, we don't even have time to get into that, but both of her husbands are white men. And that's really significant at that time in Montana. Um, so, you know, spend a moment with that. And then this reality on the 1880 census, which was taken in the summer of 1880, she gave her age as 24. So this is a lifetime to live in 10 years, no matter who you are, right? And we can all step back and take a moment with that. And so, you know, that was a realization moment where I had to start thinking about how in awe I am of this woman and everything she survived. And that's the spirit of being a Westerner that we are so compelled by, right? That endurance. So here, I wanna talk just for a second about that research journey to finding Sarah, um, because it was a journey and it involved a lot of different people and a lot of different support over time. Um, and, you know, developing better historical research skills as my own right, understanding of how to do this work grew. Um, but as historians, if we're going to write about our subjects, we have to be able to find them. And fortunately, I was, you know, about 24. It was not lost on me, about the same age Sarah was when she had just finished going through all of those incredibly traumatic, difficult things in her life. Um, and 24 is the age to be nothing if not just like relentlessly optimistic that you are going to do whatever it is you've set your mind to. Um, so I was just like kind of too stubborn to listen to any suggestions that I might not find what I was looking for. Um, but I got really lucky early on. Um, so as I've said, everything that was known about Sarah when I first got to Virginia City in 2007 fit on one eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, roughly. And it wasn't clear where she had come from. And both Tennessee and North Carolina had been suggestions at that point. Um, and in fact, those are both still on Wikipedia. And so if anybody wants to go update that, um, please, please have my endorsement to do that when this is over. Um, but so my first step in trying to pin her down, you know, to one of those places, well, I had to really think about where might she have been from. I had a vague suggestion that her first last name, um, her maiden last name was Blair. So that was really what we were working with. And I will never forget that moment of walking into a Tennessee archive and just saying, you know, like bright eyed announcing to this archivist that I was looking for some records of a single woman who I thought had been a slave who might have been owned by a family named Blair who maybe was from this area. And could she please help me find all of those records and she laughed and it was a very like disappointed laugh of like, oh, honey, like, we, okay, but um, but to her credit and to the credit of so many others, um, always be nice to the archivists. Um, she found me everything there was about the Blair family. And in the midst of that research, this emerged. Um, so this is a page from the census from 1860 from Jonesboro, Tennessee. And it had kind of, we pinned it down at that point that she'd probably come from that area. Um, but for whatever reason, on this census, the census taker chose to enumerate every slave in Jonesboro, Tennessee on Schedule One, And that was not normal. In 1860, there was still a separate Schedule Two for slaves. On Schedule One, everyone's enumerated by name and all this information is collected about them and what they do. Um, and that was not the case for Schedule Two. So this sheet of paper tells me a lot and you can see Sarah. Um, this is, I believe this is our Sarah on line eight. And the census taker has enumerated all of these individuals and in the column of color, he's made himself a little extra column and jotted in an S, which we can assume stands for slave um, because someone else has then crossed this out and written schedule two 
in the margins. And at first I was like, well, maybe he's just bad at his job. Like maybe he just doesn't know. Maybe this is a mistake. Um, but the more I dug into this research, the more I don't think it was a mistake. I think he had a purpose. I'm not hundred percent sure I know what it is, but I think like he had a goal in mind. Um, so the schedule two census didn't list people by their names. They were listed by their age and their skin color and their sex. And that was to quantify a monetary value. And so Sarah defied the invisibility that was supposed to befall her systemically in 1860. And I still get chills a little bit when I think about this because like, what are the odds? that this one lone woman who ended up in Montana running a public utilities company and promoting tourism at the site of a lynching, who would also happen to be the person on this one census in this one county in Tennessee where this one census taker decided for whatever reason he was going to record her. Um, so there are moments when I like I believe in our research abilities and our ability to reconstruct the world around things that we're not 100% sure on. That's a skill and an art form of being a historian. Um, but there's other moments when I firmly believe in our research just kind of shoving us headlong into like where we need to go. And so I credit that force of the universe for whatever, whatever purpose um, it wanted to send me on. So after 1881, um, Sarah's life quite happily gets better in some really miserable ways. She marries Stephen Evan Bickford, pictured here in 1883. They, by all accounts, have a pretty supportive and happy marriage, mutually supporting each other in different ventures. They have four children together, all of who live and outlive their parents, um, and most of whom live quite late um, into adulthood, into their 80s and 90s, and have long lives. So together, Sarah and Stephen will start to operate the Virginia City Water Company. And I do just want to reiterate here that this is not Sarah's first foray into the world of business ownership. She's, as we saw with the New City Bakery, she's operated successful restaurants and catering businesses before this. Um, and, you know, it was kind of presented for a long time. Well, she just sort of happened to come into the ownership of this company because her husband left it to her. Um, and he does leave her his shares when he dies in 1900, um, but Sarah's really probably the one with more of the business skills and the daily skills to keep this running. And Stephen certainly entrusts her with this because he's off mining a lot of the time. He's gone from Virginia City for weeks or months at a time and the water company needs daily attention. And so Sarah is doing all of that from the beginning of their ownership of it. Um, so it's really to her credit that she's able to keep it running for another 30 years after his death. Um, and those 30 years are some of the hardest times economically that Virginia City has ever faced. So we know that Sarah had to be really attuned to that. And that brings us to tourism, which I'm so excited to talk about. Um, one of the things that seemed like very markedly missing from Sarah's story when I first started this research was just the acknowledgement of her role in actively promoting tourism at the site of this building in Virginia City that is most famous for being the site where vigilantes lynched five men side by side in January of 1865 because they were suspected of being road agents. And it had been sort of in, just implied, um, just, you know, I think because not as much was known as we know now, but you know, that Sarah kind of happened to own that building. And I kind of never believed that, but believing something and proving it can be two different things. Um, but the more I got to know her as a person through my research, she was too self-aware for that to have been the case. Um, and then I started thinking a lot about how Virginia City has always had tourists, like always, always from the very beginning um, of its existence. Yellowstone National Park is created in 1872. So there are geyser parties that set out from Virginia City beginning really early on. And you know, it's always kind of a constant. Um, 
But at the turn of the 20th century, there's some new things. There's some new developments that are happening. Um, it's taking on some new dimensions. So tourists are starting to come and ask by this point about the vigilantes and the road agents because they've heard the stories. And again, they're really good stories. So of course people are talking about them. And of course in 1890, the American frontier is declared closed. And so there's this growing nostalgia about the frontier and the wild west and all the things that made it what it was, all of those vestiges of what it might have looked like and a lot of curiosity and how others can experience that. Um, so in 1907, the mayor of Virginia City, James Walker decides that he's gonna help this process along and he's gonna go up to the Virginia City Cemetery and mark the graves of these five road agents which have never been marked up to that time because like they're lawbreakers supposedly, they died in infamy. Why would you mark their graves, right? Um, so he wants to do this while he still has a living vigilante that he can take with him and he does track down such a person, A.B. Davis, and A.B. Davis goes with him. Um, and he wants to make sure he gets it right. It's not enough to just know where the graves are. He wants to know where each road agent is buried so he can install headstones. Um, and no one's entirely sure, but they've got stories about what order people were buried in, um, but they know there's one road agent they can identify because he has a deformed club foot. And if you've been to Virginia City, you already know what happens next. But I'm gonna build some suspense for you anyway. Um, so the graves of these five road agents are marked for the first time with headstones. And this is kind of a cool moment actually, because it individually identifies these men. And you know, that is a part of the story. I also don't want to be lost. They're individual people with stories too. Um, and up to this point, they've just kind of been five out of about 27 um, original vigilante executions. But by 1907, they're now individualized. They're given names and people are starting to ask about them by name. Um, so they become a really integral part of why people wanna stop and spend time in Virginia City. Because that difference between someone was lynched and died here and George Lane, a specific person died here is a pretty big difference. Um, so they become a tangible representation and of course, we also know that this happens. Mayor Walker makes the executive decision that he is going to bring home Clubfoot George's distinctive foot so visitors can see it. And so this is a really early and kind of gruesome form of heritage tourism that, that we shouldn't really be surprised we're fascinated by. Like the gory and the macabre are always interesting. Um, but it really begins to shape the way that Virginia City starts to indicate to tourists what is available for them to come in and look at. Um, and so by putting these literal relics of road agents on display. And I imagine that some of you had the chance to see George Lane's foot um, as I did my very first time in Virginia City. And in fact, this is my original picture from 2007 from that first field school of George Lane's foot. Um, and that was a long time before I knew I was going to be fascinated in or write about this history or care very much about this history, but that was still a moment, you know, that I paused and said, something happened here. And, you know, if you're from Montana, you're probably also aware of this story that George Lane's foot has now been cremated by some of his descendants, and that was a moment, um, and the memory of it is always going to be a big part of this legend, but I imagine there's going to be a little, you know, a lot of sadness now about not really getting to see the foot. Um, the dynamic has changed. But I have to just imagine Sarah standing there in the courthouse, probably running some business for the water company and like looking at the severed foot and being like, I can work with this. I can develop something based on this. 
Which brings us to race and the Wild West, which is not just the title of my book, but this was a very intentional choice. Um, because it's really important that we recognize for as profoundly unique and individual as Sarah and her story are, um, she's part of a much larger set of processes that are at work. So those historical contingencies, um, if we wanna follow that line of thinking. She's sometimes characterized as the only black resident of Virginia City and she's not. Um, there are others and of course, race in Virginia City is never just black and white as you know, it isn't in very many places. There are Chinese residents, there are Lemhi, Shoshone and Bannock and other Native American peoples who are frequently passing through. There are a host of other nationalities who are represented in this story. Immigrants from Germany and England and Ireland and Jewish immigrants and a host of other right, places and backgrounds. And so this is not just about the physical geographical space that these residents occupied because the Wild West of course also is an imagined space and one that still occupies a really important place in our collective memory of the West. And I just want to impress here that Sarah's part of that space too, that imaginary space. And she's part of that very complex dynamic process of creating legends. This story and these legends would not be the same without her and many others like her whose stories are not easily accessible to us. Um, so Sarah made a choice in 1914, a very intentional choice. And she chose to purchase this dilapidated little structure on Wallace Street that most recently had been a barber shop and it's been a host of other things throughout its time. Um, but she certainly has her choice of buildings at that point. There's a lot of available buildings in Virginia City, but this one has indoor plumbing. And this one also has this infamous beam in the ceiling. And so it's a really good business investment. Um, but really notably that beam has long since been covered up and Sarah really is the one to re-expose it. Um, so she did two things at this juncture that really speak to her business acumen. The first one is that she takes this building with indoor plumbing and she opens half of it up as a restroom for ladies. And that's really important. That makes it pretty much the only space in Virginia City at that time that is dedicated to serving female travelers. And you would have still had a lot of separation between men and women when they stopped um, at that point. So her clientele would have been largely middle and upper middle class tourists um, who are traveling by automobile on Montana's quickly improving highway system by right after the First World War to places like Yellowstone National Park. So there's this continuous theme of why people are traveling through Virginia City. Um, so that's one part of it. The other part of it is that she exposes this beam with a trap door. So she quite literally has reopened this famous site at a moment when Virginia City residents are calling for more opening of tourism, um, right, to these curious onlookers who are coming in. And they're coming to see the graves of the road agents and see George Lane's foot. Um, there are some rumors that she sold little pieces of rope as souvenirs. And this is one of the things I'm really annoyed about never being able to like track down if that for sure happened or not. But the rumor itself is important. Um, but she exposed us this theme with a trap door. So she has control over who can look at it and when, and that is crucial. And the tourists come. We know this, just one famous example. I had to throw this in. Um, in 1918, Mary Pickford, who the famous film star at that point is one of the most famous women in the country. She's reaching a peak in her silent film star career. Um, the Madisonian picks up that she's been passing through Virginia City and she viewed all the sites and all the historic points of interest, which at this point would mean 
the road agent's graves and maybe Clubfoot George Lane's foot and definitely that building, right? That Sarah has access to. And so I like to think that there was a moment when Sarah Bickford and Mary Pickford kind of crossed paths for just a second um, at this building. And Sarah is sort of like, you know, what kind of help you with? I have things to do around here. Um, I don't know if that actually happened, but I like to think that it did. But certainly that someone like Mary Pickford is aware and is fascinated by this tourism tells us a lot about how it's growing at that time. So it's under Sarah's ownership that this little dilapidated building becomes known as the Hangman's Building, which of course we still call it today. Um, and her entrepreneurship and opening it up to tourists is pretty remarkable because it's really early. It's right at the early moment of automobile tourism, which is just kind of coming into its own. And Montana highways are just getting good enough that you can travel on them without like risk of, you know, life or death, um, as tourists describe it at the time. But so in, an, in another really literal sense, she saves this building. Um, Virginia City residents are very much talking about tearing it down in 1914 to make room for a new hotel that they're certain they're going to need in the name of progress as soon as the railroad shows up which of course again if you're from like Montana you're laughing a little bit because we know that that doesn't happen until much 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 later um, but the tourists do come and in large part it's because this building and some other sites are open to them um, and that fits into that larger nostalgia of the Wild West. So that brought me back to this original question of why? Why this building? Why does this matter to Sarah? Um, and I've learned by this point that she's a really self-aware and very racially aware person. She subscribes to Black newspapers, she insists that her children get to know other people of African-American descent and takes her children to visit places like Butte where there's a larger African-American community. There are visitors from Butte that come and spend time with her children. And she travels back East really routinely, um, you know, telling her children that she's determined they will meet some more black people before they make decisions about how they wanna spend the rest of their lives. She has a daughter who is considering marrying a white person. And even though she herself has been married to a white person, her children are, right, of course, half white. Um, she's very concerned with making sure that they are aware of the decisions they're making. Um, she's certainly aware because of all her travels back East of racial lynching and the really dark stain on the country, the horrors that it represents. So this could not have been an unintentional decision. She's also more than willing to stand up for herself. And I've just plucked one quote that I think captures this. Um, I understand from what you said well in here that you were dissatisfied with the water service. If this is so, we can take it out at any time. This is a communication from Sarah straight to someone named M.M. Duncan, who, again, some of this audience is probably familiar. He's a right, pretty prominent name in Virginia City history. Um, he's an attorney. He's a state senator. He's a former city attorney for Virginia City. Um, in fact, I just found a really good little like, snippet the other day in something that he described himself as like he was going to be the terror of lawbreakers in Virginia City. And I was like, oh, such a good vigilante throwback that I wish was in my book. But um, it's not. But he's trying to strong arm her in 1930 into putting in a special larger water line to a home that he owns in Virginia City. And she wouldn't do it. And this quote is just so beautiful in its audacity of literally telling this former city attorney that he can shove it and she will remove his water service before she gives him special treatment. And for lack of a better word, this is iconic, right? This is a moment in Sarah's life. Um, 
And it's right in keeping with our very traditional Westerner sense of fairness and justice and those principles that we tend to associate right, so readily with the West. So we're almost concluded. Um, a black woman promoting tourism at the site of a lynching. Um, so this is an effigy. This is not an actual human. Um, but this image from 1939 is taken as the same time as this image of the hangman's building. It's in the same role of um, images that were taken by a photographer from the Farm Securities Administration as he's traveling through Montana as part of um, a WPA, a Works Progress Administration federally funded project. Um, and this image demonstrates that lynching tourism has become a really popular diversion by the late 30s. So he titles this a cattle thief hung in effigy along US Highway 10 to provide Western atmosphere for tourists. And of course, he has to throw in 777, the secret password of the vigilantes in 1864, in his words. Um, so tourism in Montana by this point has evolved around this premise of the Wild West as being an unruly, dangerous part of the frontier that had to be tamed. And the vigilantes fit really neatly, like almost too neatly, into that configuration of what the West was supposed to have been. So Sarah's ownership of this building is a powerful indicator of how she saw herself after decades of living in this town and interacting with those who told these legends and had been part of these legends. And it's part of her history too, by this point. And she doesn't just passively believe that, she proclaimed that right in wood and paint and dollars and all of her energy that went into saving that building. So this is the extreme in this history. It's not that a black woman was a central part of this story. It's that for so many decades, her story is obscured because she's a black person. And now we have to get to know her again. Um, but Sarah is like millions of other people who sought new opportunities in the West and the freedom to define themselves. She reinvented herself and she picked up all these shattered pieces of numerous tragedies and rebuilt her life more than once and secured her own idea of freedom against that backdrop of hope and opportunity and disappointment and the willingness to brave all these numerous hardships that shaped the lives of pioneers that have been revered in our storytelling for centuries. And she did this unapologetically by claiming the right to tell others about a famous legend that involved a quintuple lynching. And it unsettles us to draw that connection, but it really shouldn't. The Wild West was always more complex and more diverse than first glances can make it seem. And it's really a shortcoming of some of the ways we have told history and told stories like the vigilantes. Um, it's great to talk about the vigilantes. They are a great story, but it tells us something that their story has been elevated while stories like Sarah's have been obscured. Um, but we can change that. So untold does not mean untellable. And going back to the beginning of this talk, uh, which I promise is almost concluded. Um, so this quote from a contemporary of Sarah's has always struck me as so fitting for her story, uh, that history is relentless and once made cannot be unmade. And so I'm asked a lot to define what it is I find remarkable about Sarah. And it's just that, it's not what she did, it's her relentless willingness to keep going. And we can learn from that and we can apply it to the way that we tell stories. Um, and that's so important. The stories that we tell now will become the legends for those who come after us. That is how legends work. And so we have to talk about these things. 
So as historians, it's always crucial that we try and see things from many perspectives. And from Sarah's perspective, the Wild West also belonged to her. And just by acknowledging this, we give recognition to the history of Black Americans as an integral part of the Western heritage. And doing so reiterates the significance of Black hopes and dreams, which mattered just as much as any others, even though they were not always recorded and documented with the same enthusiasm. And so we need to talk about Sarah because one day I really hope her story looms just as large as these stories of vigilantes and road agents and other things that are always going to be fascinating to us and fit right in with all these other vividly imagined characters of Western history that demand and deserve our attention. Um, so it's a history that for good reason is still resonant with us and that is so important. So I hope that Sarah's story inspires you as much as she has inspired me. I hope we have questions about her that I can answer now. Um, but I hope it inspires people also, like not just to investigate history and to write books, but just to acknowledge the room that we all have to grow in hearing the voices of others and creating the sense of belonging that we all deserve, which is what Sarah does for herself and the community that she finds in Virginia City. So thank you so much. It's so weird to not have like the end of talk applause, but um, I'm super excited to take questions now. Thank you. Well, thanks, Laura. While people are thinking of questions and putting them in the question and answer box or the chat box, I um, I just wanted to ask you, Sarah, where can people get, I mean, Laura, where can people get your book on Sarah Bigford? It is widely available. It's on Amazon. Barnes and Noble has it. So all the major retailers have it. Um, please ask Montana bookstores to order yeah. it. I really would love to see it on some shelves the next time I'm crossing through. Um, and if anybody wants more information on that, just email University of Oklahoma Press, tell them like you would please like a discount code to order some copies for a bookstore. Yeah. We'll try and hook you up. Okay, that sounds great. Um, I also just wanted to mention while people are putting their questions, um, in that um, Marlette Lacey is on today as well. And Marlette wrote a book also about Sarah Bigford and it is called From Slave to Water Magnet. And Marlette was a living historian, a living history interpreter who portrayed Sarah Bigford for, for many years, probably 15 years. And um, so Marlette, emailed me today and said she was going to be on tonight and I saw her name go by so so welcome Marlette I'm glad you're on and she knows some of the descendants of Sarah Bigfoot so she was going to encourage them to watch tonight as well so if there's any descendants on yeah. thank you for for attending and and we're so glad you're here so some more of the questions um let me go through and ask some more of the questions here so um when did Sarah purchased the hangman's building. Do you know? So it's 1914 that I think kind of the formal transfer happens and she might have been like renting it or sort of occupying it for a little bit before that. But the first concrete documentation is about 1914. Um, and then she will own it. And Marlette knows a lot. I would just know like Marlette is definitely cited in here. And that was pathbreaking research that somebody I think that probably resonates with Marlette a little bit. I hope cared, right? Marlette clearly cared about this story. Um, and I totally forgot where I was going with that now. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it, it, so the building was owned by so descendants of Sarah for a long time. Her children okay. continued to own that building until I think the 1960s. Okay, so, her, so Sarah's children owned that building mm -hmm. for quite a long time. Okay. So another question was, how did Sarah get to Virginia City? Oh, that's a great question. There's so much we didn't get to talk about in this. I know. Book. Everyone will have to go but read the book because there's so much in it um, that, of course, we wouldn't have time to talk about. 
Um, yeah, so she comes with a judge. They're one of those territorial justices who's appointed to the early Montana courts. Um, brings her with him, I, I suspect is kind of a nursemaid to some young children that he had. And he didn't stay in Montana very long. He made it about a year and then he was off to California. But Sarah chooses to stay. Um, so they probably would have gone by railroad kind of as far east as they could and then taken a combination of stagecoaches and wagons into Virginia City and sleighs. Um, that's not like if you're from Montana, you're laughing a little bit about this right now, right? It's super cold in January when she arrives. And so that was an, a journey that took, you know, being a really intrepid person in and of itself just to get there. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, Dan Smith also asked a, a similar question. What did you learn about her life in Tennessee and journey from Blair Plantation to Virginia City? So um, I think you asked that question, answered that question. Kevin Koistra asks, first says thank you. And then were there any known reactions or pushback about black and white marriages in Virginia City at the time? That's a great question. Um, and I talk about that quite a bit in the book. Virginia City itself doesn't seem to have had much of a problem um, with, and there's been, there's some different ways to interpret that. Is it because Sarah is the only interracial marriage and people respect her and respect Stephen Bickford enough that, you know, they're just kind of willing to not say too much about it. Um, there are certainly other Montana communities that are very concerned with mixed marriages. It doesn't mean they don't happen, but um, there's certainly some pushback in other places. So that's one of those really unique questions about Virginia City. The town, you know, treats her as a whole in a very inclusive way, which is, you know, mm -hmm. I don't want to make too much of it, but it's admirable for that time. They're willing to give her that space. Right, right. And I think you mentioned in your book that they never referred to her as um, black or, you know, colored, air quote, colored in, in any of the things that were written about her during her lifetime or even after in the in the Madisonian. Is that right? Do I have that correct? Yeah, not a single time. Um, and how fitting that Marlette is here because actually one of the things that unlocked a lot of my research, my first time in Helena at the Historical Society looking for things about Sarah, there's a note from an archivist to Marlette saying, I looked, you know, I looked for the things you were trying to find on Sarah Bickford and was shocked to discover that she's black. We had no idea. And mm. I mean, that wasn't that long ago, you know, so that in and of itself is a really important story of how much we can learn about history when we really decide that we're gonna put our effort into it. Um, right, right. Um, so there is another question about were you able to track down any of her descendants? She does have living descendants. I did reach out. I had a couple of brief conversations um, with a couple of people and it, you know, it was their decision if they were comfortable talking to me at that point. Um, so I have not unfortunately had a lot of um, chances to talk with them, but I do welcome that. And, you know, Marlette as well, I would be so excited to talk with her. Um, and I have some information, I think about a couple of her daughters that I'm starting to develop into another project. So, um, mm. That would be very meaningful to me if they feel like the time is right to reach out and you can find me very, just Google me at Oklahoma State University. I'm very easy to track down an email for. Okay. Um, Karen says, I appreciate this talk was focused on Montana. She was born into slavery. I wonder how old she was when she was freed and how that came about. Yeah, and that's so, this is one of those super frustrating things for as much as we have as much as we know, there's still all these kind of gaps, you know, I can prove where she was and I can kind of reconstruct things around her, um, but I don't unfortunately have a lot of sources about her life, but she's, 
based on how we interpret census records, um, you know, she's a young teenager when the Civil War ends, and it's probably a little bit complicated for her because she lives in Eastern Tennessee, which is Union occupied really early on, but I don't have the sense that the Blairs freed any of their slaves. And then her immediate owner, John Blair, dies in the midst of the mm -hmm. Civil War. So there's probably a lot of chaos. And somewhere in the midst of that, she right, is given freedom at the, it would have been the very, very end of the Civil War, of course, um, mm -hmm. the way emancipation worked because Jonesboro is already Union occupied, but it's up in Knoxville and from there moving across the country. And, you know, just as a note, I was, you know, sort of insisted several times when this book was going into draft form that um, several people were like, why don't you just delete all the stuff on Tennessee? Like her story starts in Montana. This mm. is a Montana story. And I was very adamant about that, that her story starts in Tennessee. And it's so unique to have the story of a woman who was born into slavery, who we can trace all the way back. And even if we only have pieces of her life, that's still significant. Mm -hmm. I'm still hopeful that there's more out there to find. I will not be the last word on Sarah Bickford. And that's yeah, perfect. Hopefully I this really will. Hope there's more yeah, encourage a lot of people to write and that kind of goes into the next comment sam bell says sarah's story should be made would make an excellent screenplay so you know there's that <laughs> um hey. david carlson asks, does the book address larger migrational movements gold rush influxes park driven tourism etc that sarah would have experienced it does a little bit yeah i mean if we're talking about montana in the 1860s everybody who's there who's not a Native American person has to come from somewhere else, right? Everybody has migrated there from some other place. Um, so I do talk a little bit about that. Um, there's really incredible books about migrations in American history that are out there that you can find in the, in the bibliography. Yeah, yeah. Um, Greg Martin asked, did Sarah's position in the community ever get challenged due to her race? Um, you know, probably her, 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 um, position as a, um, business owner. Due to her race is the crucial part of that question. Yeah, and yeah. that's another one of those, like, we can't always know what people were thinking. Um, there are a couple challenges to her management of the water company. Like the city tries to take it over a couple of different times and it's voted down. So essentially there's a challenge saying, hey, the city should buy this from Sarah Bickford. Um, and you know, residents or whatever combination of factors don't approve that. So it's one of, and this is again, one of the, I'm sure there's some meeting minutes from some of those town hall meetings out there somewhere. Somewhere, like yeah. Probably <laughs> more to the story that we can say. Um, uh. But that question, whether it's because of her race, that is unclear because people at the time are not typically going to talk about it as like, yeah, we challenged her because she's a black person, right? They're going right. to find a way to say it that's nicer than that. And so we really have to start thinking about the motives of people and the intentions of people. And that gets into really dangerous history because we don't always right. like, we need to be careful about ascribing motives to people that right. we're not aware of. So. Um, there's another question from Diana that says, how did you find out her first husband was abusive? Oh, that's a great question. And it's, that's actually one of the well-documented things we can confidently speak to now. Um, her divorce proceedings emerged, um, luckily for me, kind of pretty early on in this research. Um, and so her divorce proceedings detailed. These are the instances in which he threatened me. These are the times when he was abusive. These are the things that I'm going to disclose to the court happened. Um, so, and we can, you know, kind of speculate a little bit that it was severe enough that the court granted her that divorce because they didn't have to. Um, divorces are not a given at this time period. So in fact, there's another well-known case that I talk about in the book where a woman is being beaten and abused and the court refuses to grant mm -hmm. her a divorce. So mm -hmm. I would think it's pretty significant 
that Sarah as a black woman is right. given the benefit of the doubt on that. Right, right. Another um, person asked, is there any reference to the bounty placed on Native Americans in her legacy? I did not talk about that and I intentionally did not talk about that because I don't consider myself a historian of Native American history. I want to leave that to somebody who that's their job and their expertise um, to talk about. It's important questions, but outside of my realm of what I'm comfortable discussing. Okay. Um, Anthony Wood writes, um, hi, Anthony. Anthony Wood writes, by the time that Sarah operated the water company, was there any widespread use of the utility and mining operations or was it mostly for personal homes and businesses? That's a great question. So in Virginia City itself, it's residences and businesses. And then farther down Alder Gulch, you're starting to get larger like dredge mining operations. Um, I'm sure there's mining experts that can speak to that much more concisely than I can, but her running of the water company specifically is just residential okay. for the town itself. For the town, for the houses within the town. Okay. Um, so um, Sandra Oldendorf says, Jonesboro, Tennessee is the oldest city in Tennessee and holds an international storytelling center. So I wonder if her story is now part of their history. Oh, I hope so. Oh, wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. If, if be so how amazing. does that happen? I'm learning about Jonesboro, honestly. And there's still a building there. Um, her owner, John Blair, ran like it was kind of like a bed and breakfast, like a hotel. Mm -hmm. And you can still mm -hmm. stay in it as a bed and breakfast. And so that gives me chills when I'm like the yeah. place where she's probably living most of her childhood, you can still go like sleep in. And I was wow. far too poor to do that as a grad student, but someday. Someday, <laughs> right, right, wow. Um, okay, so um, Karen says, do you cover her catering endeavors and everything she was involved in, not just the hangman's building? As a woman in a male dominated industry, chef, I appreciate these stories from a modern perspective, but by all means for an African-American woman at that time. So thank you for sharing that story. I do, it's the vigilante, like the vigilantes come up a lot, but the hangman's building isn't really, it's like the last kind of chapter of the book. So yeah, there's some discussion of her um, running a catering business and that being sort of her, actually that was one of the first and like best sources I found about her early on is the newspaper describing, well, Sally Brown catered this wedding and it was like this amazing wedding feast and that was one of the moments where I was like, huh, but they're just calling her, they're just calling her Sarah. They're not identifying her yeah. as a black person. And like, that's super important. Yeah. And then you know, the last thing she does, one of the last acts of her life is that one of her daughters gets married in Washington, DC and Sarah ships her a wedding cake. Like she can't make it to the wedding at that point, but she literally like puts a cake into the mail and gets it to her daughter. <laughs> for her wedding so that's, that's amazing awesome. yeah yeah so um quincy hi quincy quincy asked did, did you explore the gender historical aspects of sarah's life was she involved in any women's social clubs what were her experiences as a black woman in virginia city not just a black person so kind of that gendered aspect of of her life yeah i talk a lot about gender in the i mean you have to yeah yeah <laughs> she were a black man doing this, it would still be an incredible story. Um, but to be a woman just changes our dynamic of what we need to talk about. Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat the mm -hmm. second half so, of that question? It's uh, been a long day over yeah, here. No, no, that's okay. Did she belong to any social clubs? And I know that you mentioned that um, that she would take her daughters to Butte and there was the Montana Federation of Colored Women's Clubs that was really um, prominent in Butte at that time. And was she part of that or was there um, any clubs like that equivalent to that, women's clubs in Virginia City? I, I did try and hunt that down and I spent time in the Butte archives and- um, That's a great archives, yeah. 
That was amazing archive. I still yeah. owe them a copy of the, I need to send them a copy of this book. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good reminder. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So I, I was really, I got really excited. I was like, oh, there's these federations. And I know that she's, you know, certainly subscribing to black newspapers and she's very aware and she's going to be all the time. So maybe that's part of her motivation. Yeah. And I didn't find any evidence of that. Um, there weren't just, you know, put bluntly, there weren't enough black women in Virginia city that it would have right. had. They certainly had organizations, um, different fraternal social organizations that people were part of. I didn't find her in any of those. And so my sense is that she's kind of just like, I'm running my business. I got my hands full. There's yeah. a lot to do with this. And so that maybe wasn't you know a priority for her. But again, if somebody comes along and finds more information. Yeah. Quincy, that's your job. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we have um, a comment from Noelle Hines. I'm Sarah's great grandson, and I really enjoyed your talk. I've got lots of info, which I received from my Aunt Jewel of Tulsa, who was married to Sarah's grandson, Wilton, who was brother, whose brother, Russell, was my dad. Wow, that's exciting. That's exciting. Very, very wonderful. Well, good. Well, thanks, Noelle, for being in it. And maybe we can put you two in touch, and you could get in touch with Laura. That's exciting. Please do that because um, I'm exploring some Tulsa connections right now um, through one of Sarah's daughters who ended up in Oklahoma and who I've been really um, mm. motivated to write something about. I've been kind of tracking her through the state and you know, this is such a powerful, sorry, I'm going to probably like cry a little bit. Um, well, just, just wait, Laura, because here we have someone who from the Bigfoot side, <laughs> we have Malin Bigfoot says, I will share your lecture and this fascinating story about Sarah and her life with the family and readers of the Bigfoot newsletter. So such a powerful reminder, like, <laughs> we think about this history, we're like, oh, it's in the past, right? It happened so long ago. But such a powerful reminder. It's always still present with us if we look for it, right? This is still like a living history. And I would be honored, you know, anybody who wants to reach out to me, please do. I'm here. I would be humbled and thrilled to hear from you. Um, so Denise says, um, thank you for walking through some of the research. Uh, do you have any tips or tricks for researching some of those lesser known or possibly documented historical people? Do we know Sarah's journey from um, Tennessee to Montana? We already talked about that. What are some other Montana personalities you came across that you found fascinating? And, you know, I just have to say, um, Laura, with your book, you talked about the Black community because it wasn't just um, it really just wasn't Sarah, the only Black person in Virginia City, and you talked about that that whole community, which I really appreciated and really enjoyed that part. But, um, you know, what are some of your tips and tricks for researching some of those lesser known or, um, you know, harder to find people? You have to be relentless. You have to be stubborn. You have to get used to people telling you like, oh, why are you, you're gonna waste so much time going through that? Cause you, you, you know, you spend 10 hours of research to find that one little snippet of information. Um, so you have to put all that aside and be like, no, I care, I'm doing it anyway. Um, I, there's so many more stories of Montana women that need to be told in so much more depth. Like if there's any grad students on here that are yeah. like casting around thinking about stuff, Maddie Kastner is yeah. another fascinating story of a black woman who's married to a white man and they're very much, you know, prominent in their community of belt. Um, like there's still more work to be done on Mary Fields, who is another woman who very much deserves a screenplay. Mm -hmm. um, and there's still more, you know, the black community in Virginia City, it was like, I had done as much as I could up to the point of this book, but um, I am humble enough to say, I don't think this is the last book on this. I'm certain there is still more out there that I, in this time frame, did not uncover. And so, so yeah, Minerva Cogswell and Parthenia Swede are two black women that 
you know, also have long lives in Virginia City. And somebody needs to write a book about Jack Taylor. Um, I don't yeah. know this conversation either. Jack Taylor is a black man who's a resident of Virginia City for as long as Sarah Bickford is and runs a really successful livery company. And, um, you know, he built a really important life for himself in Virginia City too. And Sarah is his caretaker in the final months of his life. So there's all these connections and yeah. so many more stories right so so many more stories to build out this very important part of our historical narrative that we don't know a lot about so um rebecca says sarah owned the water company in one of virginia city's biggest tourist attractions but was she part of town society and leadership even in the time of jim crow or was she held apart that's a great question. I don't think she's held apart. I don't know that she seeks out being engaged in some of those things, but that's another one of those parts of the record that I was hesitant to speculate too much on. Um, we do know that she's involved with other residents. So she's certainly like attending dinners and attending parties and her children talk about being very engaged in Virginia City society is there growing up. So um, she's definitely included, I want to say, in meaningful ways. Um, but does that mean that she didn't feel like there was still a lot more room for inclusion? Mm. She didn't leave us her, you know, firsthand records of that. So it's really, really hard to say. But mm. I would hope she felt included in you know, ways that were meaningful to her. Um, and again, that's not the story. There's more. There's so much more. Right, right. No, um, no. Bar Turner says, hi, Bar. Um, she says, Sarah's story is an in interesting juxtaposition with the original name of Virginia City as Verena, after wife of Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy. Name was not adapted, adopted because of concerns of negativity from Civil War history. She says, good job. <laughs> and that's such a like, you know, fascinating. I, I speculate about that a little bit in the book. Like there's, if you're from Montana, again, you're laughing, right? There's all that speculation of where the vigilantes, maybe radical Republicans, where the, you know, the people they were lynching on the opposite side of that political divide is the Civil War. Um, we have a Confederate Gulch in Montana right next to. Yeah, so. the Civil War was, was really playing out here. Um, and, and, you know, that all that is, is just, you know, continues to play out in Montana as well as time goes on. So it's, it's such an important part, even though we're so, um, Montana was so far removed from the war, but of course everyone was coming here during wartime and, and then after. Um, so Nancy Wright asked, how and where does Sarah learn to read and write? That's, that was one of the things I was like really hoping to pin down more. Um, the best source that we have is from one of her daughters, from her second marriage, who talks about that when Sarah was small, she kind of lived around what her daughter describes as the great house mm. um, and learned, this is the exact words, learned something of the world from the children she was interacting with. And there are a lot of Blair children. So that kind of makes sense. And it kind of makes sense to me if she's living in more of an urban place, which Jonesboro would have been at that time. Um, you know, that her owners are, are a little bit more open to that because she's probably interacting with upper crust of society as she's working in that hotel environment. Mm -hmm. um, She's certainly literate by the time she gets to Montana. So okay. however it works, she has figured out um, her literacy by the time she arrives. Okay, that's interesting, yeah. So um, Malon Bickford says, Laura, here's my contact information. So I'll send that to you, Laura. I wrote it down, so I'll send that to you. I publish and edit the Bigfoot newsletter and am in contact with about a half a dozen other descendants. So that's... And then Marlette says, thanks, Crystal and Laura, for keeping Sarah alive. Thanks to Dan Smith for sharing. Um, 
what a great connection that was. <laughs> and thanks to um, Malin Bickford and Noelle Hines for joining the Zoom. I enjoyed the presentation. We'll purchase Laura's book. Let's visit offline when you can. So um, yeah, yeah, so that's that's wonderful. So let me make sure I've got a, maybe, I'm just gonna do like one more question. <laughs> it's okay, um, I have time, so many. this is fine. <laughs> um, let's see. And we were worried, Laura, there wouldn't be any questions. <laughs> that makes me so happy though. This is all I want is like people to go out and talk about Sarah. Like she's yeah. such a fascinating story. She's such an incredible human and she yeah. deserves to have us talk about her. So yeah, please, please tell yes. everyone that they need to talk about Sarah. And really like if somebody wants to update the Wikipedia page. <laughs> because I was just on there and I was like we'll have to get on there and <laughs> we have more details than this right now actually okay so so the last one here is um from Karen and she's I'm um let's see uh do you have or can you share online a list of resources of these women I'm fascinated with this niche of history and I've picked up books in my travels through the US and are, that are pertinent, but I'm dying to sift through more obscure resources online. Not at Wikipedia, but harder to find sources like you've been looking for. These obscure stories need to be shared. A couple of suggestions. Um, the Montana Historical Society has done some incredible work of making um, a collection of resources specifically on African-American pioneers available. So if just Google Montana Historical Society, um, you can come to it, the African-American Pioneers Project. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, the secret weapons of research and I'm so jealous of like new baby grad students today who have access to this, as yeah. I did not in 2007, um, right? My microfilm machine story would have been very different. Right, so, right. <laughs> but the Library of Congress Chronicling America Project has amazing newspaper, digital newspaper collections. Um, and then, you know, it sounds kind of like straightforward and silly, but Ancestry.com, you find a lot of stuff digging through Ancestry.com, the amazing collections of records they have digitized. So yeah. It's and the out there. yeah, the Montana Historical Society as well has um, digitized some Montana newspapers, um, Montana newspapers throughout the state. And so that's another great resource. In addition to Chronicling America, they have, they've kind of, you know, done some stuff that Chronicling America hasn't done. So um, just go to that Montana Historical Society website again, and you'll come across that. And um, the whole Madisonian is now digitized, which, you know, that would have, that would have been nice for you, Laura, a few years ago. <laughs> that like makes my heart pause just a tiny bit, because I've always been like, there's so much more I could probably find with like, you know, character recognition versus me sitting in a microfilm machine printing right, off. Like, right. <laughs> so um, probably yeah. an update to this book at some point, because I'm sure there's more stuff to find in there. But, you yeah, know, we got to start somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And then Marge says, thank you, Crystal and Laura. And she also says what I missed it up here. It just reminded me. Let me get back up to it. I can, but I think she said that she submitted a um, a National Register nomination. Um, okay, here it is. Just wanted to let you know I nominated Sarah Bigfoot and the Hangman's Building on the National Trust site for places where women made history on behalf of the Virginia City Preservation Alliance. So that's exciting too. That is so, exciting. Yeah, so that's great. So wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for all, uh, all the information that you imparted tonight. And thank you for this wonderful presentation and writing the book about Sarah Bickford. And I hope everyone goes out and buys a copy um, and reads it because it really does give us a much um, more complex uh, look at this wonderful town of Virginia City that we all know and love, but this time in Montana history as well. So thank you, Laura, for that. Thank you so much. It's right. like really been an honor to be here. And I'm just like so humbled knowing who is in this audience. So thank a you. Great, 
a great audience. All right, well, thanks, Laura. And thanks everybody out there and have a good evening. And we hope to see you at our next lecture in April. Thanks so much. Have a good night.